Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Today, we're in the book of 1 Corinthians, and we come today to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, no, actually chapter 14, verse 1. So get your Bible and open it up to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 today. We'll begin in just a minute. Do want to remind you quickly about the Scripture Verse by Verse website, which is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Study the whole Bible with me all the way. Three complete series, almost four, from Genesis through Revelation, verse by verse, just like we're going to do today. That's what I've been doing for over 30 years, and I've saved my work. So there's a lot of Bible there. And if you have a hunger for the word, you can go there and study the whole counsel of God with me. Just click and listen. Study at your pace, at your convenience, at the thebibleversebyverse.com. <clears throat> okay, well, let's pray. And Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, follow after love and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. Follow after love. To love should be our highest goal. Because as we have seen, it is the most important thing to God. And as we have also seen, no matter what else we have, no matter what else we do or can do, no matter what our skill level is or how much talent we have, if we don't have that, then we are nothing. It's not just that we have nothing. God says we are nothing. We are useless and worthless so he says, follow after love, pursue it. it. takes work to do the loving thing because basically love is unselfishness. It is doing what is in the best interest of others, even when it calls for self-sacrifice. So follow after love, but love does not exist in a vacuum. It serves. Look at verse 1 again. Follow after love and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. Now, to prophesy is to get out the word of God. That's what it means. Well, there was a, a small portion of prophecy meant foretelling the future, but prophecy is also forthtelling the word of God, preaching, teaching. That's prophecy. Same thing. It's delivering God's word. So when the Bible talks about prophecy, it's talking about proclaiming the word of God. So it's not a coincidence that God says, follow after love, and then immediately follows that up by saying, desire the spiritual gifts, especially prophecy. Prophecy. I told you love doesn't exist in a vacuum because it serves. And your love as a Christian is never more loving than when it is getting out the word of God or helping to get out the word of God in some way. Because in spite of what people think, that is the most important thing that we can do is get out God's word. Everyone needs the word of God for direction in this life and to show the way to eternal life through Jesus Christ, the Savior, and they're not going to get it any other way. So prophecy or declaring God's word is the greatest act of love that you could show anyone. Verse 2, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue 
speaketh not unto men, but unto God. Hold that thought for a second, okay? And let's continue. For no man understandeth him. However, in the spirit, he speaketh mysteries. Doesn't matter if you speak in tongues in public or in private. It is still a private thing between the speaker and God. Actually, it's a private thing between God's Holy Spirit and the Christian's spirit. It's a private thing because no one else, including the Christian, knows what's being said. It is private communication. Whether it's done in public or private, it is private communication between the spirit of man and the spirit of God. So, anytime you speak in tongues, it is prayer. And, of course, any type of prayer, any type of communication between a Christian and God, which is what prayer is, is going to be edifying to the one who does it. And so when one speaks in tongues, there is communication between them and God, and therefore, if nothing else... It is edifying to the one who is praying. And by the way, I do want you to notice something here. It is, as I said, whether it's done in private or public, it is communication between the Christian and God directly. It is a private thing. And it is prayer. Because notice what God says here in verse 2, speaking in tongues is man speaking to God. Well, what in the world is that? It's prayer. Speaking in tongues is man speaking to God, not God's speak, not God, God's message to man. Prophecy is God speaking to man. Speaking in tongues is man speaking to God. So, as I have said to you before, especially as a younger Christian, actually for several years, I was in and out of Pentecostal churches quite a bit, preached in Pentecostal churches, um, this is before they got really whacked out. I'm talking 35 years ago. Every single time there was a message in tongue, so-called, and the interpretation, I don't know how many I heard, probably hundreds, without exception. Every time, the interpretation would go like this. My children, I am your God. Thus saith the Lord to you, my children. Hold it. Stop right there. I didn't have the discernment at the time. I didn't catch it. But now I know. None of those so-called interpretations were legitimate. Every single one of them were fraudulent. And if you, some of you who go to a Pentecostal church, if you sit there and you hear a message in tongue and the so-called interpretation, and the interpretation is God speaking to man that violates scripture, it's not true, it's a fraud. It is always man speaking to God. So the interpretation would be directed toward God, not toward man. If it's, if it's genuine, if it's genuine tongues, if it's genuine interpretation, that's the way it's going to go. Verse 3, But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification, 
and exhortation and comfort. So as I said, speaking in tongues is man speaking to God. It is prayer, as it were. Prophecy is the exact opposite. It is God communicating to man. It is God speaking to man. And that's why it is so valuable, especially in the early church, where the supernatural element in prophecy was being exercised because at that time they did not have the completed Bible. The Bible, that which we study verse by verse, all 66 books, all 31,000 plus verses in the King James Version, that is prophecy. Every word of it is prophecy. It is all God speaking to man. But this, there, there it is. This is just what I said about prophecy. It is God's message to man. The entire Bible, every single word is prophecy given by God to man. And notice verse 3 again, but he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. God does not speak in order to drag his people down. God's word will challenge, absolutely. God's word will correct if need be, but it will also encourage, inspire, and give hope. Verse 4, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. I have heard people blast the gift of tongues, treat it really with contempt. And I'm not saying, I'm, <laughs> I've, I've seen tons of fraudulent speaking in tongues. I know it was. And I don't know if I ever heard the legitimate gift of tongues. If I was a betting man, I would bet that I didn't, that I haven't. Nevertheless, there is a lesson here for us in verse 4. Let's read it again. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Now, he is contract. They were crazy for tongues in Corinth, and much of it, I'm sure, was fraudulent. But Paul here, because they were so crazy about tongues, he is pointing out the superiority of prophecy over speaking in tongues. And one of the reasons that it is that it is more valuable to prophesy is because prophecy is God speaking to man and God's word is edifying. It is a blessing. It strengthens our faith. Meanwhile, speaking in tongues, again, like we saw, is praying to God and the only person that gets edified in that is the person who's doing praying, doing the praying or doing the speaking in tongues. Now, of course, you cannot give what you don't have. So if you can speak in tongues legitimately, then do it because you can't edify others unless you're edified yourself. And it's the same with reading the Bible. Reading the Bible will edify you. Praying to God, praising God will edify you. Studying the Bible, reading the Bible, taking in the Word of God will edify you. And again, praying with understanding will edify you. And so will praying in tongues. God says it right here. Now, you might not like that, some of you people, but that's what God says. Praying in tongues edifies the person. So if you have the legitimate gift of tongues, and like I said, I haven't seen anywhere in Scripture where it says that it has passed away. There are people who teach that. There are people who put together an argument for it. But boy, you got to rest the Scriptures to get to that point. And I would rather just take it at face value. I'm not uncomfortable with anything in God's Word. I am uncomfortable making things up simply because I don't personally like it. But you can't give what you don't have. 
So edify yourself any way you possibly can so that you can edify others. Now, I have heard people, I suppose mostly Baptist, probably mostly fundamentalist, over the years, I have heard countless preachers and Bible teachers blast the gift of tongues as being a terrible thing. Honestly, I have heard them say with my own ears that it is selfish. Speaking in tongues is a selfish gift because it edifies oneself and not others. But it has always amazed me that those people never blast the Bible and people who read it as being selfish because the Word of God edifies those who read it too. Why is that not selfish? Again, you can't give what you don't have. So if you want to edify other Christians, then you have to edify yourself first or you have nothing to give. That means pray. That means read the Word of God. That means praise. That means draw closer to Jesus so that he can flow through you and then through you bless others with the edification that you have received from him. <clears throat> I can tell you what's going on. The degree that some people will go to explain away parts of God's word that for whatever reason makes them feel uncomfortable never ceases to amaze me. Why not just accept the word of God as it is and learn to live with it and learn to take advantage of it? By the way, how dare anyone say that God has given his people a gift that is selfish. You better watch what you say before you denounce tongues simply because you don't like it or it makes you feel uncomfortable. And again, let me repeat, I don't know that I ever heard a legitimate message in tongues. And I've heard hundreds of them, especially in my early life as a Christian. But I'm not going to explain it away because it's in the Bible. And I wouldn't dare denounce it as being selfish because that impugns the integrity of God who gave it. And I agree that prophecy is more edifying to more people than speaking in tongues. I get that because that's what the Bible says. I'm, I'm with you all the way on that one. Verse 5. I would that ye all spoke with tongues, which, by the way, implies that not all do speak with tongues. I would that ye all spoke with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied, for greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues except he interpret that the church may be edified. <clears throat> like I said, prophecy isn't only God telling the future, as some people might think. Prophecy is the proclamation of God's word, teaching, preaching, reading, communicating God's word in any way is a form of prophecy. Communicating God's word is the most important thing that can be done. That's why those who do it are doing something greater than speaking in tongues. God isn't knocking tongues when it's legitimate. He's just saying that proclaiming his word is more beneficial to more people. Six. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? Except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. 
So listening to God's word, listening to God-inspired prayer in another language is like listening to someone ring the doorbell over and over and over again or plunk away at a piano. It is a waste of time because there's no instruction. The noise doesn't make sense. The noise doesn't edify because it doesn't make sense. Seven, and even things without life giving sound, whether flute or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? Yeah, like I said, plunking on the piano can only handle that for so long. Listening to someone plunk on the piano or blow a trumpet who doesn't know what they're doing is, is worse than useless. It's like listening to someone scratch their fingernails on a blackboard. Listening to someone speak in tongues is just as useless. God doesn't expect us to enjoy or be edified by something that we do not understand. Eight. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Well, you know, just like the, the old west, the Calvary, Calver, Calvary, yeah, they used to blow trumpets, you know, for charge or retreat or whatever the case. A bugler needs to know how to play so that he can communicate the right message to the rest of the troops. One song may mean that the day is starting, another means it's over, another song means that it's time to charge, etc., etc. But in order to make sense to those who hear, there has to be order in the bugle playing or the trumpet back in the days of Israel who used the trumpet for the same purpose. Order communicates something. Order communicates something. Disorder does not. For example, order in creation communicates the fact that there's a wise God who designed and created it. God is not the author of confusion. If something is confusing and without orderliness, it's not of God. Chaos is never of God. Confusion is never of God. Verse 9, so likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. The Corinthian church, as I said earlier, went overboard on the uh, so-called gift of tongues. Everyone was trying to do it, and no one knew what anyone else was saying, and the whole church service was a waste of time, nothing but chaos. The Corinthian Christians were acting like immature spiritual babies playing with a new toy. 10. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. When I hear two people speaking in a foreign language with each other, it's meaningless to me. And I sit back and I listen to them, and I don't really understand what they're saying. Doesn't make sense to me, you know? I know they're communicating with each other, but I don't get it. Any language is great if you understand it, God is saying. However, it is pointless for us to sit around listening to words that we don't understand, especially if we can go somewhere else where words can be understood, and that is especially true when you're talking about the Word of God. People should come to church. They should turn on a teaching ministry, whatever the case, to learn about God, not to listen to Babel. 12. Even so ye... For as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. In other words, try to do whatever you can to help other people be better Christians. Work at doing 
the most good for the most people for whatever time you have left here on earth and do it all for the glory of God. That is a life that is pleasing to the Lord. That's Honestly, that's my, if you want to sum up my goal for living, get out as much of the word to as many people as, as I possibly can for as long as I can possibly do it. That's it. That's what drives me. 13, wherefore let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. It is impossible for a Christian to be built up in their faith and drawn closer to Jesus unless they understand what the Word of God says, because it's the Word of God that edifies. That's the only thing that edifies. That's why the Lord instructs Christians to pray for the gift of interpretation so that what was spoken in an unknown language can be made known. At least you get something out of it. The Word of God is not assimilated by magic. It has to be understood. 14, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Praying in tongues, God commends it right here. It's great. He commends it. I'm not going to say it isn't. Because it is a direct connection between the speakers, the Christian spirit, and God in prayer. That's pretty amazing. But you don't learn anything about God from doing it, and neither does anyone else because no one understands what's being said. 15. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Paul said he prayed in the Spirit. Paul said he prayed in the Spirit. So don't let anybody tell you that it is wrong. Praying in tongues or praying in the Spirit is effective prayer because, again, it is direct communication between you and God, between your spirit and God's spirit. So pray in the spirit. If God gives you the gift of tongues, a legitimate gift of tongues, pray in the spirit. But still, pray with your mind. God wants us to tell him what's on our mind. The Bible says, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to God. It's important to talk to God about the things that are on your mind. So there's no substitute for that. 16, else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the place of the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest? Praise, worship, and thanksgiving to God are contagious. One person praising the, Lord, the, praising the Lord will stir up the spirit of another who hears them, and they often start praising too. It's like a wildfire. It spreads. So, yes, says Paul, praise in tongues, but praise with the understanding also because you can start a positive spiritual chain reaction by talking about Jesus and praising him in the language that everybody understands. 16. Else, when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the place of the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest? For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. God wants all Christians to be edified. God loves it when you bless him, and that can be done through private prayer, of course, and private worship, but he is also interested in you being a blessing to others. In fact, if you really want to bless God, then be a blessing to other Christians that you know. Because whether you are a blessing, whether you are blessing God directly or blessing his people, it all channels up to him. He loves it. He loves it when you bless him directly. He loves it when you bless other people. It's all the same to him. It all gets channeled up to him, and he's pleased with it. I got to stop here. Continue studying with me, as I mentioned at the beginning of the broadcast at thebibleversebyverse.com. Don't forget, I'm not underwritten by a large church or denomination, so if you would like to stand with me and be a part of this ministry, pray for me. Pray for the Word of God. 
Also, when you take a break, click the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. I'd appreciate it. Until next time. So long, everybody.